Today I'm going to talk to you about the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and my slides are divided into two sections. Uh, I'm going to tell you about our publishing model and then the consequences of our publishing model. For those of you that haven't seen the encyclopedia before, we're located at the URL plato.stanford.edu, uh, and uh, <clears throat> this is you basically can search and browse the encyclopedia, and it's one of these um, ideas that we had back in 1995. We started with the next machine, put it on the web, had a web server, and then we started with two entries, and then off we went. And the idea was, we thought, well, it doesn't make sense anymore to make to put a reference work into print or fixed medium because the web allows you to do, make it revisable. Currently, we have 1,478 entries, about 20 million words. Uh, and I know by Wikipedia standards, that's just tiny. I guess you guys are about two orders of magnitude more, uh, in, plus a factor of three or four or five. Uh, the purpose was to organize our community uh, of professional scholars in philosophy and related disciplines around the world to create and maintain an up-to-date open access reference work for our colleagues, the students, the general public with entries on topics that are relevant to the human condition. And I take it all of you know roughly what philosophy is, what kinds of issues philosophers talk about, things like democracy, things like voluntary euthanasia, things like political philosophy, philosophy of biology, philosophy of physics. There's all sorts of, it's a wide variety of, of topics that we cover in the encyclopedia. But we also cover some rather arcane topics that you won't find in a standard encyclopedia. You won't find it in Britannica, you won't find it in Wikipedia. For example, if you go, philosophers are interested in the topics like this, holes. What are holes? Well, why are holes interesting? Well, they're interesting because, well, they, they have a location in space and time. They have a dimension, they have a shape, but they don't have mass. So philosophers like to think about the nature of these entities, and occasionally, the fate of the free world hangs on the definition of such abstract things. And you might wonder why. Well, this may be before your time, but in the 2000 election between Bush and Gore, you may remember it all came down to a question of whether or not the ballots in Florida had holes in them. And it turns out that a reporter, uh, that one of the Florida election officials, uh, went in front of a group of reporters and said, waved a ballot around with the hanging chad and said, I don't know what a hole is, go ask an expert. So somebody typed in holes into Google and they found the Stanford Encyclopedia article on holes by Akili Barzi and <clears throat> Some reporter went to interview him and said, well, what is, does a hole in a ballot have to be more like a hole in a colander that completely perforates the surface? Or does a hole in a ballot have to be more like a hole in the road, which only deforms the surface? These are questions that philosophers are interested in answering. So that's what you'll find in our encyclopedia, things on arcane topics that sometimes have a significance. Um, now, <clears throat> uh, it turns out, for those of you who may, who may not have known this fact, uh, but in Wikipedia itself, they've discovered that most articles, if you click the very first link in an, in, given in an arbitrary Wikipedia article and keep repeating the process, click the first link of the article you get to, keep clicking the first link, you'll eventually reach philosophy. And so at least there's a, that connection between our projects, and uh, I think that's kind of an interesting fact uh, that shows the significance of what, at least what we're trying to do. What's our mission? Our mission is to introduce students and colleagues without any special knowledge of the topic to issues uh, and the most important pieces of literature on a topic so that they can read and understand that, that literature with insight and understanding. So that's a pedagogical goal but we also have the following goal for our profession. Namely, we want the authors to update and report back to the professional community as new research is being produced and published. Now, you think about it. This is those of you that read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. 
you know, we have a group of scholars out there who are all like our informants. And, and any article in the Stanford Encyclopedia, someone is responsible for updating it, the author or the group of authors that wrote it. So they are in charge of keeping on a regular basis, reporting back to the profession on the new changes, the new ideas that are being published with respect to that. And that's the, that's the mission for, for our, our encyclopedia. And we've now attracted an international group of scholars. Uh, it's a project based at Stanford University. The server sits on a desk in an office. There's only one Mac Pro that serves the encyclopedia, uh, and it seems to do just fine. We have mirror sites in Australia and the Netherlands, tons of backup systems. Uh, we have uh, contributors at, from universities all over the world, uh, and individu individual entries have been translated into a variety of languages. But our publishing model is what might be of a special interest to you. First of all, it starts with an advisory board, and that's the philosophy department at Stanford University. And of course, the members, the faculty in the philosophy department themselves have to go through a rigorous vetting process before they can get tenure. And of course, the, the tenure has to be approved all the way to the provost level, right? So we start with them, and then they appoint two administrative editors. And by the way, in this talk, I'm going to be using the word editors very differently from the way Wikipedians use the word editors. For us, an editor is somebody who reviews entries, who referees entries, who evaluates entries, he doesn't author content like your editors do. We call our authors authors of the content, okay? So, so when you hear the word editors, don't think author of the content, someone who's actually changing the pages. So basically, we start with two administrators. The, the advisory board then has two appoints two administrative editors. I'm the principal editor, and it gives me research time so that I can have a, a, lar a significant research profile so as to be a leader, uh, try to be a leader in the community, and a senior editor. And what we do is we make the final editorial decisions uh, based on the recommendations of our subject editors. Where we, we, conduct scholarly communications with all the different people involved in the encyclopedia project. We plan, we budget, we manage a part-time staff, we have technical, we, we do all the technical infrastructure. We set up the server, you know, uh, configure, configure the Apache uh, web server, we do everything. Basically, it's all done with two people, plus uh, one associate editor and five assistant editors, all of whom work part-time. So the total paid staff is basically three full-time people, the two administrative editors and the five assistant editors, right? So that's what we do. Then we have a, a group of volunteers. Our editorial board, now these are the people who do the evaluations, the subject editors, there's 140 of those, and they're grouped by subspecialties. And if you go there, you can see that you know, they include groups on aesthetics, African and African American philosophy, ancient philosophy, philosophy of biology, Chinese philosophy, epistemology, and so on and so forth, right? So that's the list of our editorial boards. So we have 140 of those grouped into subspecialties, and we have 1,800 volunteer authors, and they volunteered from universities around the world, and we occasionally have external referees if an article is submitted that's beyond the expertise of one of our subject editors, then we go and ask for a volunteer who's an expert outside our editorial board. And then our readers provide us with an extra layer of quality control. Now, um, our publishing model is based on a kind of an entry life cycle. So basically what happens is an entry is created by the sub at administrative editors after we get input from the subject editors. They, the subject editors tell us Ah, it would be good to have, on the basis of my understanding of the, this particular section subject area, it would be good to have an article on X, and so you should uh, put into the database an article on X, and sometimes we get unsolicited proposals from members of the profession to have an article on X, and then we will, and if it's approved, then we'll put it in there. But of course, before we put it in there, we perform a consistency check. And then the entry is then produced, that is, it's written, refereed, revised, refereed again and set several rounds of the referee pro process and then published, and then it's updated for a certain amount of time over the course of 10, 15, 20 years, and then when an entry is no longer being updated by the original author, well then we have to find some new arrangement. 
because we don't let an entry stand in the encyclopedia unless someone is responsible for maintaining and updating it in response to new research. Now, typically the arrangements are we ask the authors or the subject editors to find new co-authors. And this can sometimes be tricky because an author may, you know, think of the author, someone, suppose you take the author who wrote on St. Thomas Aquinas. Now this is a person who spent 20 years of their life reading through all of Aquinas' works. And on the basis of all of Aquinas, his reading and familiarity uh, of Aquinas' works has synthesized his knowledge into very finely crafted prose to try to give an insight as to what is in common, what are the common themes across the various works that Aquinas wrote. And this person is gonna be reluctant to have just anybody come along and be a co-author and update and edit his article. I can, you can understand that. So sometimes we have to make some arrangements with the authors, try to find a junior colleague that they're happy with. And if those arrangements can't be made, uh, then the subject editors, when the entry is no longer being maintained, then the subject editors have to commission a replacement. Or in the case when an entry has served its usefulness, it's somehow no longer an important topic in the philosophical world, it may simply be retired to our archives. And an entry can also evolve in certain ways. Uh, it can be subsumed by another entry, it can be split into two or more entries, and it can be retitled and rescoped. and we have several examples of these in the encyclopedia. Now, the workflow is also rather interesting. Um, Every entry goes through a cycle of a sequence of states. Now, that sequence of states, so every encyclopedia entry is in one of 10 or 15 states. Let me just give you a quick look at this workflow. So you start with a subject editor suggesting an entry, and then the administrative editor, that's me, I create the entry, so you can think of Ed as me. Uh, uh, or board, then, then once I create the entry, the subject editor is then given a deadline to suggest an author. And then once he suggests an author, I'm given a deadline to invite the author. And then once I invite the author, the author has a deadline to respond. And if they decline, well then it goes back up to an earlier state. If they accept, then they have a deadline to write the entry. Right? And then it goes through various, when they submit the entry, I have to examine it and determine that it has the right form, and if it has the right form, then I can send it out to be refereed. So then I send it to be refereed, and then it gets refereed, and then the author has to revise, and we go through several cycles, and eventually at the very bottom here, I get a board member uh, who finally says, uh, you can accept the entry. And so then a, a message comes to me, this is all done through password protected interfaces, uh, and the subject editor will then say, okay, you can accept entry X as is, and then when I see that message, I can click a button, and off it goes into web space, right? And this actually leads to some rather humorous situations. In fact, our whole philosophical background system uh, becomes philosophical because we have an entry on death, and when the subject editor says death is okay, is ready to be published, I get a message that says, accept death as is. <laughs> and I just love it when our, when our system becomes philosophical in that way. Uh, okay, so that's how things work. Um, we've, uh, the authors can submit their entries in Word, LaTeX, or HTML, and then they go through, as I mentioned, multiple rounds of the vetting process. And then when they're accepted, they go into a production queue and they get converted into HTML5 or MathJax, uh, depending on if there's technical stuff in there. We've recently adopted MathJax as a standard. And then we generate page proofs in PDF from the HTML. Uh, we basically were able to hijack Apple's WebKit to produce these PDFs. Uh, and then uh, the authors then proofread and submit their final corrections, and then I publish it by moving it into web space. Now, the interesting thing is, as soon as it gets published, the entry goes into the state, the author must revise with a four-year deadline. However, the deadline is simply a default. In the case where there are significant new publications, then the authors are expected to revise prior to the four-year deadline. So this is really now, someone is now looking out for that concept that the topic is about the entries about. 
And uh, once we've published the work in HTML, then the authors are expected to remotely edit a copy, an uh, offline copy of our, on our server and edit the raw HTML. And we give them some help on this. The only exceptions are when they're completely rewriting or revising the entry altogether, okay? Okay, so now another part of, important part of our, okay, so that's, that's how entries get online. And as you can see, we try to be a force for good because we share the, the idea of having an open access. So we have these expert-based uh, uh, articles that are free to the world, and we hope that they will uh, be a positive force, though, of course, you know, people can always misuse the encyclopedia. Occasionally, Uri, my co-editor, and I dream about, uh, uh, idly dream, uh, about uh, making sure that if anybody searches the uh, encyclopedia for the entry on time travel, then they don't, they don't get to search for the problem of evil because we don't want people to think about doing things like going back in time and doing evil things and getting away with it. Uh, but of course, uh, there are other things that come up. We've noticed that there are uh, theological, for example, theological seminarians, I won't say which denomination, that have looked at the entry on paraconsistent logic, which is about the, the logic you have to adopt if you reach a contradiction uh, so that things don't blow up. So there's all sorts of interesting things that people are looking for uh, in our encyclopedia. Now, uh, our publishing model also includes what we call the quarterly archives. Every, on the vernal, you know, on the solstices and equinoxes, we create a fixed copy of the encyclopedia and we put it back online in a special series of archive pages. And because we publish these archives four times a year, the Library of Congress and the Directory of Open Access Journals consider us to be a serial publication and we got issued an ISSN number. So each archived edition is available in perpetuity from our archives and of course it creates a fixed, unalterable copy of our entries. And you can go back, you can scroll back all the way back to get archives back to 97, quarterly archives. Now, um, of course there's a disadvantage here is that not every edit that's, uh, that's uh, for every version of the entry is saved. And so, for example, if an entry is published on, on day one and then updated and corrected on day two prior to the next archive date, then, the only, then only the day two version is going to be saved in the archive. Now, of course, that, that's, a, that's a disadvantage, but of course, we have an email trail, a record, and a background, a, a, a log uh, of all the different edits that the authors made that are in our log history in case any issues come up so we can reconstruct things if it becomes relevant. But the advantages to this are that uh, we have a manageable history of versions that can be understood at a glance. Uh, we don't have to track rapid changes introduced by different people with different points of view because we don't have different people editing the same article. It's always the authors who are editing the article. And moreover, so suppose we publish an article and the author, after reads it more closely, now that it's in web space and available for everyone to see and they discover some typos, well, they can fix those typos and the article will not, the, the article will actually be archived for the first time with the typographic fixes in it rather than just uh, being uh, archived with, with the errors. So those are the advantages of doing it in that, that way. Um, the next thing, uh, in addition to our publishing model, you might be interested in our funding model. Now, our funding model <clears throat> basically, uh, of course, since it's based on open access, we don't earn income from selling the content. It's not behind a paywall. So our total budget, and of course, again, this is probably minuscule compared to what you're dealing with, um, is a, a total budget of $500,000 a year, and it's funded in a, with a variety of income sources. We get money from the Stanford University General Fund, uh, uh, we, get, we have three endowment funds, we have royalty and reimbursement income, and we have income from uh, the membership dues that are paid to the Friends of the SEP Society, which is a separate website that we maintain on a different server, and by joining this society, students can join for $5 a year, uh, associate members can join for $10 a year and professionals for $25 a year, you get very nicely formatted PDFs of the encyclopedia entries. So you get PDFs and not, HTML, and not just the, the raw HTML. 
uh, and that's proved to be uh, a, a supplement to our income. It covers about 10, maybe close to 10% of our annual budget. Um, but the interesting thing are the endowment funds. Now, two of them are straightforward. We, get, we have an endowment fund for small private donations and for large donations. But the most important endowment fund is the library, the money we got from the libraries in order to support this. Now, this CEPIA is the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy International Association. And basically what we did is we went to the libraries uh, and library consortia and we said, look, normally you pay for encyclopedias. You pay for access to encyclopedias and we don't want to have to put us behind a paywall. So to sustain us for the long term, we would like you to contribute and be a partner with us so that we can stay free and open access for the long term. So what we did was we, we partnered with the large library consortia and we got a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, a $500,000 challenge grant. And then we told the libraries if they will pay membership dues, the money is paid in the form of membership dues to, a, to this organization, CEPIA, which is actually hosted at the uh, University of uh, Indiana then Stanford will take those dues under a contract that says Stanford will take the money, invest it, pay out only to the encyclopedia at 5% a year, and if Stanford ever shuts down the encyclopedia, the money goes back to the library with any, in, with any unspent interest and appreciation. So what that means is, you know, Stanford typically makes 10 to 15% annual return, and if they're paying out 5% to us on the endowment, well then, five to 10% gets reinvested back into the principal. So what that means is that the library membership dues can be seen as an investment in open access. And that was a key, one of the perks we got in the, into raising $2.3 million in an endowment fund from the library community. And we gave them other perks as well. We, we brand their page, we detect the IP address and then match it up to domain names and if it matches, uh, with a library that's committed, that's committed funds to CPIA, well then we put a little branding banner and we say thanks in part to the library at such and such university. We also allow them to download standalone copies of our archives and we give them an acknowledgement on our, uh, on our thank you page for all of the libraries that have supported us. So finally these, and I mentioned the Friends Society and uh, the only difference between the $5 and, the, uh, the, and $10 a year versus the $25 a year Memberships is that with a $25 a year membership, you can download an unlimited number of PDFs within any given amount of time, whereas if you just join as a student or as an associate, you're limited to at most five PDFs within any 24-hour period. Okay, so that's our funding model. And then finally, the last element of our model is the copyright and licensing model, and this again might be of interest to you. Um, well, authors retain copyright. And what that means is that they've you know, spent a lot of time putting together, analyzing their knowledge, and producing an, an entries that are average around 12,000 words. So we let them retain copyright, but what they do is assign to us an exclusive license to electronically distribute the work via all the internet protocols. FTP, HTTP, mail protocols, right, things of that kind. So authors are free to republish their entry verbatim in any fixed medium, such as paper or CD-ROM, but they're not free to put their entry on another server. Okay? They can't put it on any other web server, not even on their own homepage. And the reason we do that is for the following reasons. If they were to put copies on another server, well then they would then people could access that other server and that would undermine our access log count on our server, and that undermines our impact statistics, and that undermines our ability to raise funds because we can't show as much of impact. Another reason, if they put a copy on another server, they would undermine our page rank in Google or other search engines because people could then build links from their websites over to that other server rather than building links to our server, and you know, Google measures authoritativeness on the web as by page rank, which is a measure in part uh, a recursive measure of uh, the link structure to your website on the, uh, uh, to buy it from other websites. If people put copies on other servers, then the, the copies could be changed in ways that our evaluators and subject editors don't approve. If they put a copy on another server, there would be a new citation path 
people might be confused as to what's the proper way to cite this article. If they put a copy on another server, they would make it difficult for us to count all the accesses. Right, right now, because everything comes from the Stanford University server and its two affiliated mem uh, uh, mirror sites, we can count and measure the impact individual articles are having. And this proves to be valuable for the authors because then the authors can use those impact, those, those counts as part of their promotion uh, files, right? They can say, well, look, this has been accessed 12, 20,000, 100,000 times uh, for each of the past acad academic years. So that's why we have this particular copyright uh, and licensing model. And as I mentioned, we do ask for royalties, but only in the case where it's a commercial publisher who's going to try to end up putting an encyclopedia article in some book uh, and, then, uh, and, and then make money off of it. And from academic translation pro projects who want to translate our articles, but they have to do so under the condition that we can vet the translation through our own contact network and make sure that it's a, a, co a correct and valid translation. And then we ask for a small fee to reimburse us for our costs. So that's our, that's our model, publishing, copyright, funding. And um, <clears throat> I'm tempted to just stop just for a second and see if there are any questions about the model before I start talking about the consequences of the model. I know it's unusual for people to stop in the middle of their talk. Yes, do you have a quick question? Very quick, yes. I'm, I'm a user. Uh huh. Uh, and I just appreciate, you know, what you do. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, because you know, you have the philosophy is a complex subject, and it has layers of meaning. Yes. And sometimes articles just only, sorry, touch upon one of those layers and not the others. And so I was wondering, you know, how could it be done if you could actually have two or three versions of St. Thomas Aquinas, for uh, instance? Oh, yes, okay, very good. Yeah, we tried that. Uh -huh. uh, we, we actually tried that early on. We thought, oh, you know, there might be some topics that are just so controversial, it's going to be difficult to get an objective and neutral analysis by one scholar. We did that with uh, cosmology and theology. <laughs> and it turned out that the, you know, one was written by somebody who had theological leanings, one was written by someone who was a physicist, uh, a philosopher of physics. And it turned out it just ended up being dueling articles and we said, this is just not gonna work. Uh, and so basically now we just have one entry and the entry has gotta have to be objective and neutral and if Basically, the argument is if there's any controversial issue that's, you know, the literature doesn't come down on either side clearly, then the article has got to reflect that. They have to acknowledge controversies as such. So, you know, it's got to, that, that's the best we can do with respect to that. So, yes. Any other questions about the model, how the model works? Hello, this is not about the model itself, but I would like to mention that you do have on the encyclopedia different aspects of the same topic. Uh, and, you know, it is Aristotle's ethical, you know, ethical works, Aristotle's metaphysics and so on, and not just that, not just divided by works, but, but literally the aspects of the same, one the same more general topic that have their own entries. I mean, I've I've, I've seen that a number of times while I've studied university myself, studied philosophy and used your resources. Would yeah, you but those are all non-overlapping. And what she was talking about was having two different entries are, that are overlapping as such, and the, about the very same thing. So we don't have two entries about the very same about thing. About the very same thing, well, that would be ridiculous. Of course. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, the, you might argue that you know, some topics are so controversial that you can't get a neutral, objective article about it. But so, anyway, that's so can't you, can't you use two authors, in one in one single? Yeah, that, that's hard to do. Is, that's is very it? hard to organize. Yeah. Oh, sure, thank you. Yeah. But it's a it's an idea. One last question b before I move on to the consequences. Yeah, does this model evolve over time? Do you change the model? What is the model changing at all? Yeah. Which part adapt. of the model did you think might change? Which part? Uh, the whole model. How, how do you create the articles? How you get money with it? Ah, 
Uh, yeah. Or is it one so time far, set and works forever? So far, uh, look, by the way, our model did not evolve all, I mean, did not come out of nothing and get created all at once. It evolved over time. Between the years 1995 and 2005, we were up, up changing elements of the model and revising and developing the elements of the funding model. And so now we've got something in place that works for us. Uh, and of course, if someone comes along and shows us that there's something that's not working, we're happy to try to adapt. Uh, so, so uh, but at the, at the moment, things, to be, things seem to be working pretty well. Okay, I'm sorry, I see other questions, but maybe you can put those off till uh, the, I talk about the consequences. All right, so the first and foremost interesting fact about this model is that we have a collegial community a relatively small professional community of authors and subject editors that have a shared understanding of how th this process works and communications for the most part tend to be civil and respectful, at least between the authors and the subject editors, though on occasion uh, things flare up. This typically happens uh, offline, not in the public eye though, so it's something that myself and my, my colleague Uri and uh, the senior editor and I have to try to resolve and adjudicate uh, by email. Our license enables credit and control for the authors. So although entries are neutral, the authorial style and insight is preserved and their own pr professional expertise is demonstrated. And as I mentioned earlier, this can help authors uh, advance their careers. And indeed, the subject editors as well put, put this down in their promotion files when they move from associate professor to full professor. The fact that they're a subject editor for the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy uh, is, is helpful to them. Um, and the other interesting thing is that the contributors, and by contributors I mean the authors and the, ref, the, the subject editors, uh, they are stakeholders in the success of the whole project. Uh, the authors sometimes lend their expertise as occasional referees on other entries of which they're not associated with. Uh, the authors themselves become widely known by having published in the encyclopedia as a worldwide expert on this uh, topic, right? Um, sub subject editors themselves sometimes decide, well, you know, I have a side expertise on a particular topic and I'd like to uh, write an entry and so they can sometimes write entries for the encyclopedia as well as be subject editors. Uh, I myself wrote entries on the philosopher Gottlob Frege and on Frege's theorem, uh, and other subject editors have done similar things. Um, and as a result of having all of these contributors having a stake in the success of the project, we found that many of them would go talk to their librarians in help in getting their libraries to support the encyclopedia by joining that membership organization. So when we went to the librarians, we basically got them into kind of a squeeze play. We had the philosophers at the departments around the world talk to their librarians from below, but we made our arrangements with the library consortia. And the consortia then advised from above the librarians that were part of the institutions that were members of the consortia. So all of this worked to, to our advantage. Now, uh, the way we do uh, dispute resolution is first of all, the subject editors, when they review an entry that's been submitted for publication, uh, well, of course, you know, it has been invited typically, but then before it goes online, it has to be refereed. And, since, and as I mentioned, there can be several rounds of the referee process. The subject editors almost always give us permission that's, and that by, I mean us, the administrative editors, the people of the, who are managing the central command and control, um, they give us license to revise the language in their comments to be constructive. Because we find that if, you know, instead of just making critical comments, if you make constructive comments, the authors will be more motivated to re revise and improve the next draft. Uh, what kind of disputes do we have to handle? Well, there are disputes among the subject editors these are the people who are d deciding what the topics are. Uh, they have to decide which authors to invite, and they have to decide about the content. So we sometimes have multiple different reviewers of the same article prior to publication, and sometimes they give compli conflicting opinions about the quality of the content. So we have to resolve all that, and this is done through 
laborious email analysis point by point of the issues involved and it all takes place prior, prior to publication. Similarly, we sometimes have disputes between the authors and the subject editors or the referees or the readers. Some people, now prior to publication, the, the authors might say, well, I've now received two referee reports and they're in conflict with one another, what am I supposed to do? Or they might say, I think this referee had a bias. And typically we keep the referees anonymous if at all possible, but some subject editors like to make themselves known to all the authors of the entries they're in charge of. Um, so you can basically, from the numbers, it, since we have 140 of these ref, uh, subject editors, if each subject editor is responsible for about 10 entries, that gives you already 1,400 entries, but some of them have taken on more, and that gets us to the 1,500 entries that I mentioned that we currently have online. So typically, a subject editor will manage about 10 to 15 entries and be responsible. But then, of course, there's issues of scope, interpretation, and pedagogy. Sometimes we get um, email from readers who write in, in, in all sorts of interesting questions and raise valid points that were overlooked by the subject editor and the referee process. So after publication, another responsibility of the author is to respond in a timely way to any valid criticism. Um, so um, basically, the validity of criticism from readers and colleagues is de de determined by uh, the administrative editors in consultation with the subject editors and our specialized referees, right? So, um, so as you can see, we've made it easy on ourselves. We don't have a problem of editing wars, right? That's, that, that's, a, that's one of the interesting features of our model, consequences of our model. Now, another uh, feature of the, we've tried to build into the Stanford Encyclopedia is the, uh, the idea that entries should be self-contained. Now, uh, basically, if you look at our articles, they're made up of fewer, longer entries instead of numerous short entries. Uh, on average, they're about 12,000 words. The subtopics, sometimes instead of commissioning a new entry, we'll say, ah, oh, this topic should really fit in within some other entry, and then we'll legitimize an extension of another entry that was already previously online, and we'll ask the author to either include that subtopic for the next revision or take on a co-author to help him do it or her do it. Um, more substantive articles, because, because they're 12,000 words, they do re really merit greater academic credit uh, because it's a significant body of work. And it's easier for us, uh, being a small community, to organize and maintain these fewer numbers of large entries than, than you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of articles like you have in Wikipedia. Um, so, but the important thing here that I want to stress is we tell our authors it's really important to minimize the number of cross-referencing links within their article to other SCP articles. We would much prefer that the authors introduce and define and explain briefly any concept that's required to understand the rest of the article. And uh, because by studying these long form articles, that means a student simply has to stay focused on reading that one article. They don't have to go off and read other articles in, other, in order to understand the current article. Okay, yes. Um, uh, and so uh, then we're gonna minim, so what, so we don't have this question, what portion of each LinkedIn entry must be read, uh, you know, in, in order to continue reading the present entry in order to finish that entry with insight and understanding. And I encourage you to sort of compare, for example, the entry on Arrow's theorem in Wikipedia with the entry in uh, the SEP. Now, unfortunately, philosophy doesn't seem to attract a lot of women into the profession. Roughly 21% of professional philosophers are women. And so we've made uh, an effort to increase the number of women contributors. Uh, currently, 23.4% of our editorial board is made up of women. Uh, and that's up from 18.7% uh, and 55% of the most recent appointments have been women. And 18% uh, of, uh, of our authors are women and that's up from 17.9 and 20% of the new authors are, are women. And we've been sending email to the subject editors to encourage them to nominate women authors and to check that work by women is appropriately cited. We've sent email to authors to make sure they've cited all the appropriate publications 
And the justifying feature is that we have a large section on feminist philosophy in the encyclopedia. And the previous speaker, I think, would be willing to testify that, uh, that those, some of those are actually worthwhile entries that, are, that, that, th that he uses those in order to help inform some of the Wikipedia entries. OK, um, we have an issue in the encyclopedia as to what is appropriate for citation. And um, so we think that what you can cite in a journal article is different from what you should be able to cite in an authoritative reference work. And so one of our policies is that entries in bibliography should not cite unpublished manuscripts. Uh, and a work has to earn the right to be cited in the encyclopedia by undergoing peer review. And so there's an open question in the profession. And if you're interested in reading about this, there's some blog posts. And I can send you the link. Just send me the email. Uh, send me email, and I can uh, tell you the link where you can find those. Um, so basically, what we say is, if you want to cite unpublished work, then if it's available on the web, you can do it by putting links in a special section called Other Internet Resources. And so we do allow authors to cite unpublished papers that as long as they're available for inspection on the web. Uh, and of course, we have policies in place that prohibit authors from oversighting themselves. Um, so we make sure that entries stay current because, as I mentioned, that authors are responsible for doing so. And we find we try to find authors with a lifelong interest in a topic to join the project for the long term. Uh, it may happen that they can only join for a short term, but the default is that people join for an indefinite period of time. And we've had some people who've been with us for 20, the 20-year 20 history of the project. We send out email reminders on a regular basis. Uh, this is all automated. It determines what the state of the entry is and who owes work by what date. It compares every night. It checks the current date against the deadline for every entry and ships off an email to remind the person who owes work that the deadline is approaching or the deadline is passed. And occasionally, we have to add, we have to follow up with a personal email message. And so we tr also have editorial policies in place to make sure that the content doesn't stagnate uh, and that the, the entries come up for periodic review. Uh, over the long term. Uh, so finally, my last slide is on what is an entry? And this is a kind of a philosophical question. Uh, yes, uh, and th th this question is something that we talk about constantly uh, because uh, our conception of what an entry is uh, has changed over the years. So our first criteria is that it's got to be an entry is is should be based on an active, coherent body of primary and secondary literature. Uh, and we ask ourselves, is the topic too broad or is it too narrow? Should it be a subtopic of an existing entry? Is it already sufficiently covered in other entries? And can we justify the resources? I mean, we have limited resources with a budget of under $500,000 a year. We just can't have an entry on every topic that everyone would like to see in the encyclopedia. So we have to make hard choices. And it's just an unfortunate fact of life. If we had greater resources, well, then we, could, we, we, we would be able to have a, a, a less stringent policy. Uh, so um, we also asked the question, what's the unifying factor for an entry as the content and research shifts focus? And so basically, our conclusion about what an entry in the, in the Stanford Encyclopedia should be is that it should be the vetted product of a credentialed expert's considered and prof professional reflection on a topic distilled into a standalone neutral introduction aimed at students, colleagues, and members of the public who may have no special prior knowledge of the material, but who are motivated to spend time and effort learning the material. So that is how we kind of carve out the, the conditions under which a new entry is to be um, uh, in introduced into the encyclopedia. Now, they tell me I'm out of time, but strictly speaking, I let questions in for five minutes earlier, so I should get an extra five minutes. But in fact, I'm at the end of my slides, so I'm happy to take questions for the remainder of the period. Thank you.